Okay, if you have your copy of God's Word, and I hope that you do, uh, Ruth, the fourth chapter, Ruth 4, and we'll be studying 11 through 12. And we study um, in the second week of Advent, redemption born in Bethlehem. And what, what a great writing by God's hand is this strand that we call human history. In his history of his redeeming work, his redemption, God writes Ruth. Stephen taught um, about Adam and Eve's family uh, last week, their loss of Abel by the murderous hands of Cain, and how Eve had lost two sons that day. Yet God remembered his promise to the serpent. A son will be born of the woman who will crush the serpent's head. Hope was in Abel, but... Hope was crushed in Abel's death. God provided Seth and then Enosh. And the people began to call upon the name of the Lord once again. God continued his promise through the flood in Noah and in his sons. Who even after the salvation in the ark were found to be wicked from birth in the eyes of God. God promised Abraham a seed who will bless the nations. The seed of the woman's uh, promise continued through Joseph, Egyptian slavery, Moses' exodus. Yet the people of God entered from the exodus into the land of God's promise with no king. It was in the time of Judges that God zooms in on a family that seems to all other, if you're writing a history, Small and rather insignificant. From a small town of Bethlehem, a man takes his family away from the sufferings of famine and into the Gentile land of the Moabites, where his sons take foreign wives. The man and his sons die tragically, leaving a woman named Naomi, a widow, along with her Moabite daughters-in-law. Ruth, a Moabite and widowed daughter-in-law of Naomi, wanted to come back to Bethlehem with Naomi, who was bitter with grief. A sign of her good and loyal character in Ruth. And it was here she meets Boaz, a relative of the family, and the only hope of redemption for the widowed Ruth. And it's here that we join Boaz with the elders seated to purchase the land and redeem Ruth. So if you've, ha- if you've found your place, Ruth, the fourth chapter, we'll start in vo- verse 11 and go to 22. All the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathra, and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. He went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the woman said, the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age, for your daughter in law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Peretz. Peretz fathered Hetzron. Hetzron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. And Aminadab fathered Nashon. And Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. And that is what we will study this morning. Let us go to the Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, what a precious time this is that we can open our Bibles with them before us. We hear the word of our God from ancient times. O Lord, we ask that we would see Christ in this passage. 
that the Advent longing of the, for the Messiah of ages past, our longing for Christ to return to complete His kingdom work, Lord, this would be satisfied in the good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God, our Redeemer. So, Heavenly Father, bless this message. Bless your servants. Lord, may it be your word that we hear, the word of our good shepherd that we may follow, and you would be glorified. And Lord, we ask for these mercies in Jesus' name. Amen. So, the elders seated, Boaz gives his speech. He will redeem the land of a dead man. He will redeem the widow of a dead man. And of course, Boaz knows his rank in the family, and knowing the higher rank, the redeemer of the family, he asks for his blessing of the land and marriage before these elders. This goes to Boaz's character, too. He obeys the Torah, the law of God, humbly submitting to the higher rank in the family as well as the elders to make this decision. He could have just taken his wife, Ruth as his wife, and go and do whatever he wanted to do. But he did the right thing. And Boaz's family members turns down the purchase uh, of the price of the land and this expensive marriage to the widow Ruth because this uh, redeemer says it would impair his inheritance. So Boaz, they are both yours to redeem. The expense of the price of this dead man's land, the marriage to a penniless widow, is yours to redeem. The elders give their blessing to this marriage. They say, may the Lord make Ruth like Rachel and Leah. Why? Well, the elders blessing this marriage to produce children, yes, and you could just leave it there, but it is deeper than this because they go on from there, right? Who founded the nation of Israel. It is more important. This here, they're talking about the blessing of the children of the promise of God. And in this benediction from the elders who know their Bible well, is given to a foreign woman, once a widow, and seen as damaged good and no worth. Rachel and Leah were women who were torn for the, for the 12 tribes of Israel, founding the nation, and the 12 promised sons of Jacob. Tamar is an interesting blessing as a side note. She disguised herself as a prostitute, so Judah, one of the sons of Jacob, would hire her and conceive a son. And this is the promised line of the seed of Eve, the promised son who has come to crush the head of the serpent. And Bethlehem is the place Rachel gave birth to Benjamin, which was a difficult labor as Genesis 35 records for us. This difficult labor, as the curse of Eve's painfulness in childbirth continued, led to Rachel's death. And she was buried in Bethlehem. The pain of childbirth, yet God's faithfulness to provide a son, continues the longing anticipation of redemption through the line of these women. The one to come, born of the woman, who will crush the serpent's head, will also defeat death forever. And this is the beauty of God's redeeming work through history. The, the world discards people which ceases to have value to them. The, the usefulness is gone, or the deep grief of a young widow like Ruth and an older woman like Naomi who simply desires to have grandchildren, now grieving a dead husband, dead sons, and no hope of grandchildren to continue the inheritance line. The world looks the other way with mere surface pity. Oh, pity Naomi, pity Ruth, how sad it is as we turn our heads because they have no worth. And as we see in this long line of God's redeeming work, what does he do to this, these couple of women? God redeems and God blesses through these elders. Don't miss the fact that these elders of Israel are giving a benediction. May the Lord make Ruth like this. May the Lord bless you. Who is, the Lord who is blessed, bless you. And these elders say, we are witnesses. 
But we are witnesses to God's redeeming work, which is why we give this benediction to your marriage. And God's people received this land by God's mighty hand from the Exodus, a kingdom with a land but no king. All this during the time of Judges, as we read, where everyone was doing right in their own eyes and there was no king in the land. The promised seed of Eve is a promise traced through a Moabite redeemed, a great-grandmother to King David in the line of the Messiah, as we read in Luke 3.32. The genealogy of Christ, the genealogy of Messiah, the genealogy of Jesus who sits on David's throne forever includes this redeemed Moabite widow. Now, just think about this for a minute. This divinely written love story, as we're only peering into the end of it, recorded for eternity, reveals a God that has his hand on all nations. Great and small wars, big things, big events. And yet, his eye is also on a small town farmer in a small village of Bethlehem, and a penniless widow from Moab. It seems a small thing in human history. If you were to go out and write a history, this is not something you and I would include. But we here, and we are invited in to see Boaz and Ruth get married. The announcement had all the witnesses at the city gate rejoicing and giving blessing. And if we remember, the first negative statement in Scripture is what? It's in the eternal Word of God. The first negative statement is, it is not good that man should be alone. It is for this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. The joy of marriage is a celebrated joy when recognizes a good gift from God. And Boaz and Ruth are no longer alone. God put them together for his redeeming purposes. You need to see this in Ruth 4. Just look at 13 and 14. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And he went into her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, this is the the older woman, this is her mother-in-law, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. So at the sight of God's redeeming work to Naomi, through Ruth's redemption, women rejoiced and said, Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is more about this is, about, this is about more than just the gift of life, more than having children. It is here. There is a joy of having children. There's a joy of the gift of life, yes, but this is about a longer strand, a longer tracing of God's history, his redeeming history. This is about God's worship. And before we even go through the rest of this text, this is something that is incredibly important. Because sometimes we, we get the tracing, we get the, the, the facts right, and we put them in line. Why is God redeeming? Why is God acting through this through history, tracing the promised seed of the woman who's coming to crush the head of the serpent? He has come, and he is acting for the sake of the worship of God. So what do we do with this truth in God's redeeming work to Naomi and Ruth in regard to the worship of God? A bitter widow accompanied by uh, a loyal but foreign widowed daughter-in-law or redeemed by a God of steadfast love and mercy. A God who makes and keeps a promise from generation to generation. Yes, this is true. It is wonderfully true. Yet, I fear that there are those hearing my feeble voice trying to make sense of this wondrous truth with my very limited abilities And this wondrous truth holds absolutely no weight or bearing upon your soul. So push me aside for a moment. He's like, well, don't even think about me. I want you to think about this is God's word. He is speaking to you. You are meeting him. So listen and draw near. God is ancient. He made the holy men and women of old tremble with dread before his holy presence. The upright, the righteous person 
fears the Lord with great trembling. Do you come to this, the hearing of the word of God, confronted by a holy God of awesome power and justice, with a holy trembling? Or did you see this? Well, this is just another checklist of the day that is Sunday, of the week that I have made for myself, and I'm just going to, can't wait till this is over so I can get on my merry way. Or are we being confronted by a holy and terrifying God that we tremble before with humility? From the dead of the night of this world, along with its dark sinfulness, my sinful soul barely makes it through prayer and the sermon with any strength that I have left. And that's the place of trembling before God, where our only hope of making it depends solely on the mercy of God. Was God merciful to bitter Naomi in her deepest grief? Was God merciful to redeem the Moabite Ruth and her brokenness as a widow and damaged goods to the world? Yes, gloriously so. When God's awesome, undeserving grace visits like a bright, re brilliant, redeeming light piercing through this dark, sinful, immoral, idolatrous world like the judges where everyone was just doing whatever was right in their own eyes. There is beauty, great beauty in God's redeeming love for his people. This, there is this revealing of God's faithfulness in his covenant promise to our forefathers. When he says there will be one born of the woman who will come to crush the head of the serpent, no matter our longing, the depths of our griefs, you know He will fulfill that promise. All the way in Luke 2, and I'm sure this is, uh, this is some Advent reading for all of us, but in Luke 2, when the angels came to the shepherds who are keeping watch over their flock by night, the angels said to them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now I can continue on. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was an angel with a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. In the city of David, the sacred place of God's redeeming work to Naomi, to Ruth, through Boaz, to Obed, to Jesse, to King David, is born to you good news of great joy. What is the good news? A Savior has come. The Savior has come. Christ the Lord. And this place before God that makes the upright tremble and bow down in worship is reconciled by Christ. To see God's, to see God's redeeming work to provide Adam and Eve with Seth, then Enosh. The people call upon the name of the Lord. To see God's redeeming work to Naomi and Ruth, the crowd says, blessed be the name of the Lord. They have remembered you. He has remembered you and you are without, you're not without a redeemer. Then he traces on a long line of God's redeeming work. Begone with the promise in the garden. One, the serpent will bruise the heel while he crushes the head. Blessed be the name of the Lord who is, is our worshipful hymn sung at Christmas. For Christ, the promised offspring of Abraham to bless the nations, has come. Why? To seek and save the lost. The saying is trustworthy. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. For the worship of God. So, dear sinner, we can sin. Damaged goods to the world, worthless and without hope. Does your longing heart search through the world for worth, for purpose, for pleasure, for joy? Does your heart search within to find peace and joy, and only to find yourself frustrated? Turn away from your pride and turn toward God with trembling. He came at Christmas. He approached his cross on Good Friday. He rose from his grave at Easter and with full authority and glory seats himself upon the throne of grace to save sinners. Look to Christ for God's redeeming work for you.
By faith alone in Jesus alone, you receive the benefits of his mighty works crushing the serpent's head, his goodness and mercy following you all the days of your life. And join the procession of singers who sing, Blessed is the name of the Lord, as these singers did with Naomi. This family joy that is found in the marriage of Boaz and Ruth, blessed so richly in God's mercy and steadfast love, just springs God's promise that blesses all nations. Something that would have been, that seems so small and insignificant in a small village of insignificance is how God chose in His sovereignty to continue to trace the line of the most important thing in His redeeming history, Christ Jesus the Lord. And He blesses and He redeems His people. It is good news to the people, you and me. And this family joy is found in God's family. When God, when God invites me into his family, which I am in by being born again, is to enjoy this great promise given to Adam, to Abraham, to David, through this love story of Boaz and Ruth. The promise of enjoyment is the promise to enjoy God forever. So we trust him and his excellent promise that we've discovered here this morning. We are witnesses of God's redeeming work like these elders were. And this witness of God's redeeming work is Christ in us. This room and live stream, I'm sure, are filled with souls made worthless by sin, damaged by the world which turns their face. The sadness of such darkness gets a grip on our own hearts, the world turns away with that same level of surface pity. But not the greater Boaz, who is Christ. You see, Boaz only had enough money to redeem this small plot of land in Bethlehem. He couldn't redeem the whole earth. You go to Boaz's field today, and Bethlehem is no longer in the family. Both Boaz and Ruth, sadly, have gone the way of their fathers into death. And that is the sad but just punishment of sinners. Nothing lasts. Adam and Eve died. Abel died. Seth, Enosh died. Noah died. Abraham died. Joseph died. And you can see this progression through the Bible. So-and-so begat so-and-so, and they died. That was not the seed promise. Then so-and-so begat so-and-so, and they died. That was not the seed promise, but the seed promise continues. And God traces this through history, something he had planned from old. Is this the son of the woman who has come to crush the head of the serpent? Is this he? Is it Obed? Is it Jesse? Is it David? Is it Solomon? Is it any of these men? And it continues down through the line, and you know where it goes, into more darkness and sadness and the sinfulness of humanity, broken by sin. Is this the one who's come to redeem us? Yet God unfolds His promise to our forefathers over time. He will be born of the woman. The line will continue until the promise is fulfilled. What seems a sidetrack is actually God's faithfulness to His promise planned of old. The line of God's Messiah will come through Ruth the Moabite by Boaz, whose genealogy is recorded at the end of the book for readers to see King David has come. This little town of Bethlehem suddenly becomes important, but not ending there. It doesn't end with the importance that it came with a great king who went the way of his fathers into death. But we see this in Micah 5, which was read for us earlier by Pastor Stephen. It says, You of Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, an insignificant village, it's small, and it wouldn't be even recorded in histories. Nobody cares. For you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Therefore, you shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. 
Yes, the painfulness of childbirth continues, but there is one that is coming from this painfulness of childbirth that will crush the head of the serpent. He has come from ancient times. He will be ruler of my people Israel. The origins of this birth is in this small village of Bethlehem will be of ancient times, God promises. The ancient of days, God would take on flesh in Bethlehem. The city King Herod had to inquire of when they magi visited looking for a newborn king. Hey, what does the Bible say? Where is the Messiah to be born? Bethlehem. A village whose nearby fields had shepherds bear witness to the angelic hosts praising God. Back in Ruth 4, and in verse 17, it reads this, the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed, and he was the father of Jesse, the father of David. There is, there is something special here <laughs> that would take an entirely different sermon to completely unfold. But I want to do this briefly. So I want you to zero in and hear this. If you recall God describing the curse of sin to Eve, her childbirth will have pains greatly increased. But from this great pain of childbirth comes great hope in the promised son. The loss of Abel was painful. The grief, the painful birth of Seth revealed God's faithfulness. But there is a kin continued in this. I think God's faithfulness to his covenant unfolds in this drama here in Ruth. Now, you seen through Naomi as well as Ruth. Naomi lost her husband and her sons with no heir. The grief would have been immense. I understand completely why she says, call me bitter now. That's what I'm going to be known as. I'm bitter. I have lost everything. But redemption for Ruth meant redemption for Naomi, and these women recognized that. And it's not just them. There's a personal care from God, yet it is, not, it is not only personal. And oftentimes, we're tempted to just leave it there. It's a personal relationship. It's just me. It's just God being personal to Naomi. No, He is personal, yet the personal care of God's redemption is for all His people. For this line carries down to Christ the fulfillment of God's promise that is for all the people's. By the will of the Father, Christ redeems his people and his land. Christ, the Redeemer from Bethlehem, has come for more than this small plot of farmland. But to be Redeemer of the whole earth, he has the merit to do so. Christ dies for his wife to redeem the church. We become the children of God by the adopting love of our holy God by faith in Christ, who is our Redeemer. Christ rose again. That his inheritance of land and wife will be eternal. So Jesus is God's faithfulness to his promised redemption and rescue. Who Jesus is, his torture and death on the cross, pouring out his blood for the redemption of sinners, is the revelation of the love of God. Our sin debt so great and are worth so little, although humanity owns the debt and its worthlessness, only God and God alone could pay it and redeem it. And just as the Exodus generation was redeemed from Egyptian slavery, Christ redeems us from sin slavery and sin's wages, which is death. And go back, though. In Ruth chapter 4, 14 through 15, let me read this again. The women said to Naomi, Blessed be the name of the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Well, there's a lot of promise in a baby. I think this is going beyond just seeing the baby. The Lord is blessed in this name that is being renowned. For he has not left this family without a redeemer. God has not left us without a redeemer. God is the restorer of life through his redeeming work. Even in your old age, they say. And Ruth, the Moabite, who 
loves you, dear Naomi, loves you, is worth more than many sons, has given birth to him, they said. The promise of God continues, O Israel. Could this be the one? Could this be the one? Is this the one who's born of Eve, who's come to crush the head of the serpent? He is in the line of the one to come. Truly, great is thy faithfulness, O God. In the time of judges in Israel, when immorality and idolatry arose in the people and in the land of Canaan, which would, they would know as promise, land and widows redeemed by God's mighty hand, who is the father of the fatherless and the defender of the widows. Oh, how there is longing for the one to come found at the end of Ruth. There is longing for the son of David born in Bethlehem, Christ the Son, God's redeeming love. And there's no greater love than this, than Jesus the good shepherd laid down his life for his sheep, for his friends. In this small village of Rachel's last birth pangs and the promise in Benjamin, the place of her death and burial, the small village sees God's redeeming work with and through Naomi and Ruth, through Boaz, Obed, Jesse, David, the line of Jesus Christ. God's redeeming work, revealing his saving work and his awesome power wasn't found in Pharaoh's house. It was not found in Pharaoh's wealth and power and imperial might. It was found in the wilderness. It's not found in a major empire's capital city, but the, a village that was small even in the land of the clans of Judah in Bethlehem. It's not found by worldly kings, famous people, but in Boaz and the redeemed Ruth. And when we launch forward, we know it's not found in Herod's palace where everyone along with Jer Jerusalem was troubled, but it was found in a major manger in the small village of Bethlehem. So where do you find your Advent longing satisfied? Where do you go to see God's awesome power and the revelation of His redeeming love? I've seen where the world goes. But do you humbly, with trembling, go to Christ, the God-man of God's promise, who had no form or majesty that we should look at Him, no beauty that we should desire Him. In fact, He was despised and rejected. The world turned their face from him, seeing him worthless. Seems so contrary to our pride, does it not? And our self-pleasure to look upon the rejected Jesus for our satisfaction, for God's redeeming love, to see him lifted upon a cross, he who bore our sins and our iniquities. But for me, for a prideful sinner who looked for pleasure and love in the world and found it lacking. I sing, blessed be the Lord. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord. His redeeming love has taken my griefs, and the deeper than Boaz's redemption of land and widow of a dead man. Christ, the redeemer of the world, who takes the sin of the world, redeems his bride, the church, and the world it is just in his inheritance, the inheritance of the nations, to the glory and exaltation of Christ now and forevermore, who is to be enjoyed and glorified. Amen.